Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo and we're very pleased to host today's webinar on exploring MPAs around the world with case studies using the MPA guide. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Jenna Sullivan Stack from Oregon State University who um, will be telling you more about the webinar and letting you know who all our presenters are. Jenna? Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here, everyone. We're really excited to share our work with you and hear your thoughts and questions during our discussion. Um, my name is Jenna Sullivan Stack. I'm a research associate at Oregon State University on the West Coast of the United States. Um, I work primarily on area-based conservation in the ocean and how we can use insights and knowledge from science and other ways of knowing um, to design and manage ocean protection and conservation more effectively. Um, I am joined here today by some wonderful colleagues from around the world. Um, we're excited to share some stories with you from a new paper that just came out in Marine Policy about a week ago now um, about how assessments of marine protected area quality, not just quantity, can help improve conservation and the outcomes that we get out of these areas. Um, we'll be talking a lot about a tool called the MPA Guide, which um, is a tool for understanding the biodiversity conservation outcomes that can be expected from different kinds of MPAs um, and how that knowledge can contribute to better ocean management across scales. Um, I will give a quick overview of our work and introduce the MPA guide. Um, and then I'll pass it to our first speaker, Dr. Stephen Johnson, who is an assistant professor at Cornell University in the United States. Um, he'll be sharing the results from a regional assessment that he did of MPAs surrounding his home islands in the Mariana Islands. And then next, we'll hear from Dr. Sylvain Yakumi, who's a senior researcher at the Zoological Station in Anton Dorn, um, part of the Sicily Marine Center in Italy. And Sylvain will be sharing some work that she did in collaboration with others um, to look at the Greece MPA system and create a report to the prime minister, um, making recommendations on how to improve that system to better achieve the outcomes that the country is um, in wanting out of their MPAs. And then finally, we'll hear from Beth Pike, who's the director of the MP Atlas at Marine Conservation Institute. Um, and she's gonna be sharing the results of an assessment that she was that she led that was also published recently at the global scale um, about what outcomes can be expected from the 100 largest MPAs globally, which um, constitute the vast majority of MPA area that's been reported. Um, I guess I'll just say also, we're gonna reserve the last 20 minutes for a discussion. Um, so please keep track of the questions that you have for us, entering them into the Q&A box. We also, I think, have um, some other co-authors from our paper, experts around the world, um, who've used the MPA guide to assess the quality of MPAs in their context. Um, if you are one of those people, please introduce yourself in the chat um, and contribute to the discussion in that way and um, feel free to enter anything into the chat. But if you do have a question, it would be best to use the Q&A box. And we'll do our best to leave at least 20 minutes so we can have a nice discussion together. Thanks so much everyone for being here. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna give a brief overview of the tool that we all use to get a sense of the quality and expected outcomes of different types of MPAs in all of these different contexts. Um, the MPA guide was published in Science in 2021. Um, that QR code goes to the paper, um, the full version of the paper. And it's the work of a very large group of collaborators um, who came together to create this common language for understanding MPAs. And the goal is to increase transparency and accountability so that we know what protected means in the word marine protected area for any given MPA. Um, this was the collective work of a very inclusive group of um, marine natural scientists, social scientists, practitioners, managers, policymakers, those who carry traditional understanding of marine spaces, um, and many more. So the founding partners of the MPA guide are the UN Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center, IUCN, the WCPA, and Protected Planet, who keep the official record of um, the MPAs that have been reported, and actually they will be releasing a new report in October of this year. Um, the Marine Protected Atlas, Protection Atlas at Marine Conservation Institute, um, National Geographic Pristines, and Oregon State University, where I sit, and we played a facilitating role for this project. So as I said, I'm going to give a brief overview of the tool. Um, I'm going to share the structure and logistics or, and logic of the MPA guide framework. Um, it has four elements, as you see across the side here. 
And then the matrix on the left side shows how they fit together to understand expected outcomes from an MPA or MPA zone. The first element is the stage of establishment. And this is really an understanding of whether the MPA actually exists in real life in the water and is making um, a difference for marine biodiversity. So the stages are proposed committed, designated, implemented, and actively managed. And when an MPA is proposed or committed, somebody might have stood up at a conference or something and made a commitment to make an MPA in an area, but it hasn't actually been acted on yet. Um, designated MPAs have a law or official rulemaking in place, but aren't actually implemented in the water yet. And when an MPA is actually implemented, that's when biodiversity benefits can start to accrue. And even better, actively managed MPAs are when um, management is modified to better achieve the results that are, that are wanted. The next element is level of protection. This ranges from fully protected, highly protected, lightly protected, minimally protected. This is really about what is the scale and impact of activities that are happening inside the MPA area um, or inside the zone if the MPA has multiple zones. And um, you know, what are the extractive and destructive things that are happening and what might be expected? So in the next slide, I'll actually really go into more detail about how that is, um, is assessed. But for now, um, I will move on to the, the third really crucial element that's not actually shown in the matrix, but is prerequisite to the matrix. It's the enabling conditions. And these are the ecological, social governance, design principles and processes that are really needed for the MPA to be effective. Um, things like transparency and communication, adequate budget for management and enforcement, um, ecological design principles of networks and connectivity, all of those things that we know are important for an MPA to be effective. Um, those need to be in place for the, for the outcomes to be achieved. So if these key enabling conditions are in place and the MPA actually exists in the real world and, and, and is at least implemented in the water, the level of protection determines the outcomes. So that's what's shown in, um, in the matrix with the fish. We would expect in the top right corner where there are bigger and more fish, highly and fully protected, implemented and actively managed MPAs are where we would expect most of those um, outcomes for biodiversity to accrue. So that might be, um, yeah, higher diversity, higher abundance, things like that. So the way the level of protection, we think about level of protection and assessing it, um, is by thinking about the different activities that are happening in an area, so the scale and magnitude and frequency and level of impact of these activities. Um, and the activities themselves are listed across the top here, mining, dredging and dumping, anchoring, infrastructure, aquaculture, fishing, non-extractive activities like recreation or cultural activities. Um, so if we think about fishing, for example, um, a highly and fully protected MPA would have either no fishing or very low impact fishing happening, maybe traditional fishing that has been shown over generations to be sustainable. Um, whereas a lightly or minimally protected MPA might have more moderate and large impact activities with fishing gears that might just be destructive to the bottom, things like that. And then if we think about anchoring um, as another example, it may be well regulated and enforced in fully and highly protected areas, for example, with mooring bu buoys installed to avoid anchoring in highly sensitive habitats like coral reefs or seagrass beds, whereas we might have higher impact anchoring happening in these lower levels of protection. So this slide is really showing just a summary of the impact that these levels of protection can have on generating outcomes for marine biodiversity and recovering ocean ecosystems to the really productive and diverse systems that we've had in the past, which is shown on the very far left. Um, a fully and highly protected area would be expected to do things like increase species abundance and diversity, increase resilience to warming and acidification in many cases, the ability to withstand disturbances, um, as well as providing services to humans like coastal protection, uh, water quality improvements, provisioning of fish through spillover to adjacent areas, especially when those areas are overfished. Um, and lightly and minimally protected areas, as you see on the far right, wouldn't be expected to deliver those outcomes um, in the same magnitude as the highly fully. 
Okay, so the MPA guide has been out in the world now for a few years, and different people have been using it in different ways to understand MPA quality and improve it. Um, managers, academics, governments, many different types of people have been using it. And then for different purposes, like tracking progress towards um, area-based ocean management or ocean protection targets, like uh, 30 by 30, for example, understanding if the area that exists in MPAs is actually likely to deliver the benefits that were the motivation behind setting those targets. And we'll hear some more about that from some of our speakers. Um, providing a common language so everybody is, is clear what we mean when we talk about MPAs, um, comparing across different areas, improving existing MPAs, as well as thinking about how to work backwards from the from the desired outcomes when planning new MPAs so that the um, regulations and activities are compatible with the act with the outcomes that are that are needed from the area. And as I said, we just had a paper that recently came out that's synthesizing um, many of the completed assessments that have happened around the world are using the MPA guide. Um, you see those assessments in this figure um, with the pie charts representing how much of the MPA area in those areas was assessed. And we are gonna hear from three of these places next. So I'm gonna stop talking um, and without further ado, pass it to Stephen, who will tell you a bit about his work in the Mariana Islands. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. Put your questions in Q&A and um, over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Jenna. Aloha and half a day, everyone. I'm Stephen Manaakamai Johnson. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment at Cornell University. I'm so very happy um, to be here with everyone and my co-authors to share uh, one of the case studies in our manuscript. Um, the work today was conducted alongside my colleague, Angelo Villagomez at the Center for American Progress. Um, this work was uh, supported by funds from the Packard Foundation in partnership with the Friends of the Mariana Trench, which is a local, local ocean conservation advocacy group based in Saipan. Uh, next slide. So um, I'll give a little bit of an overview of where and the kind of situating of the Mariana Islands. Um, it's a place I know uh, very well, it's my home, but uh, for many of you, um, maybe the first time you're encountering this part of the world. Um, so the Mariana Islands are located in the North, Northwestern Pacific Ocean, consisting of 15 volcanic and raised limestone islands. The Marianas are divided into two U.S. territories or colonies in Micronesia. We have the territory of Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, these islands are home to the Chamorro and Rafalawash people who are indigenous um, to the area. Um, between the, the two islands, um, or, or rather these islands are located roughly 12,000 kilometers away from the continental United States. Um, but despite this distance, they actually take up a pretty significant chunk of the United States ocean area. Um, the EEZ is uh, just shy of um, 1 million square kilometers. Um, but given their distance from uh, the US mainland, um, the ocean uh, kind of conservation and management landscape is this really complex mosaic of local and, and federal laws. And because of this kind of complex federal uh, colonial territorial relationship, uh, many of the marine protected areas that we'll be looking at um, kind of fall under different management um, perspectives um, that are largely influenced uh, by this issue of scale. Next slide. So we're gonna take you through a short, uh, quick little timeline of um, kind of the, the modern ocean conservation um, landscape in, in the Mariana Islands. Um, so the Mariana Islands have been a part of the American kind of empire and umbrella for uh, since the late 1800s. Um, but marine protected areas are a relatively new feature of this area. Um, the first marine protected area was established um, in Guam in 1984. Um, 10 years later, the first marine protected area um, was established in the CNMI um, on the island of Rhoda. And then we have this really brief uh, moment of rapid activity around marine conservation from 1997 to 2000, where across the two territories, 10 new MPAs um, were established. 
Um, and then in 2009, um, the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument was formally established. And in 2017, that monument was nominated for sanctuary status. And so you can see uh, it's been a re relatively short amount of time with a lot of activity, um, which resulted in um, 18 unique marine protected areas in the Mariana Islands. Next slide. So here's a, a figure from our paper, which is showing um, the scale of marine uh, conservation uh, in the Mariana Islands and also the location of where these marine protected areas are. So the CNMI, which has been a part of the US since 1986, has a EEZ area of 763,000 square kilometers. And there are seven marine protected areas um, within that EEZ. But these MPAs are actually quite small. Um, only totaling an area of 17 and a half square kilometers. Guam, which has been a part of the United States for much longer, um, has a sizable marine uh, exclusive economic zone and has eight marine protected areas, uh, totaling 38 square kilometers. A really distinct feature of the marine protected area kind of landscape and portfolio of the Mariana Islands is the marine is the Mariana Trench Marine National Monument. Um, as you can see in the figure, it's uh, the area is located as one, two, and three in panel A. Um, the total area here is uh, 247,000 square kilometers. Um, and this area makes up 99.8% of protected area coverage in Guam and 99.97% of protected area coverage in the CNMI. And so you can see to, uh, most of the ocean conservation uh, space that's dedicated to marine protected areas is located in um, the monument. Next. So summary of our assessment. Um, what we did is we, we dug through um, kind of the digital file cabinets of um, the different re resource management offices in the two territories. So we're looking for public records, legislation, uh, management plans um, that could guide us to understand when, where, and how and why um, protected areas were being established in the Marianas. Um, so once we uh, found all the um, enabling legislation, we then uh, assessed to look at what um, uh, level of protections were afforded in these areas. So following the MPA guide, we assigned them, uh, as you can see here in this table, whether they were um, highly protected, fully protected, lightly protected, um, and in some cases, even making um, the distinction that some of these um, protected areas rules have been overridden by local moratoria. So for example, some of the protected areas in the CNMI were species specific, um, but these areas have now become um, kind of not unique in their protection to those species because bans or, or moratoria on those species have been applied across the jurisdiction. And in other cases, we even made the assessment that some of the protected areas might be incompatible with uh, the conservation of nature, which is one of the categories um, in the MPA guide. So after reviewing all these documents, we um, also dug in a bit deeper uh, to look at um, conservation granting information. So to figure out what were the actual dollars being invested into marine protected uh, areas in the Marianne. Next slide. So we had four key findings uh, from our assessment. The first um, is that there might be some limited effectiveness of the Marianas Trench Marine National Monument. And this is for uh, two particular reasons. It's a very large area that has very lofty biodiversity and sociocultural goals. Um, and given the way that marine monuments tend to be established through the Antiquities Act, it can kind of happen a lot faster than maybe the resources needed to properly support um, conservation at this scale are needed. And so this large area and these lofty goals might present some challenges for on the ground in water management. Secondly, um, through our assessment, there's a bit of top-down implementation process going on given the nature of how monuments are established that could limit progress. It can create some tension between local governments and local community members and uh, the federal government in implementing um, these large scale protected areas. So we identified that there's a need to strengthen local management power to protect 
against um, national interests and local needs. Second finding is that MPA management in the Marianas is quite complex. Um, a large percentage of the region is an MPA, so just over a quarter. So that's a, a positive sign, but there's a very uneven distribution across the EEZ um, is that less than 1% of this protected area is found in territorial waters. And thirdly, um, small and locally managed MPAs are actually of quite high quality, very good protections, full um, closures of areas. And so, so there's some hope there that these smaller local-based um, marine protected areas are actually potentially meeting their conservation goals. The next finding is that management capacity has potential. Um, a lot of the local MPAs are actively managed with monitoring programs, enforcement programs, and have um, up-to-date management plans. We, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, have, we looked at the conservation dollars coming into uh, the CNMI, and we found that um, about $6 million comes in each year. And given the size of the population in the area and the size of the economy in the area, that's a considerable amount of money dedicated to marine conservation. And so we um, encourage others to conduct audits of current funding uh, to identify improvements in their own areas. And lastly, uh, looking for new conservation tools in the future. Given the, um, the nature of this complex marine protected area management ecosystem uh, in the Marianas, um, we might think to look towards um, additional complementary tools um, that can support MPA conservation uh, in the Marianas. So looking towards other effective uh, area-based conservation tools might be appealing to um, kind of help meet some of these conservation goals. And I'll pass it on to Silvani. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you to this uh, evening for me. I don't know what uh, in what time zone you are. So my name is Sylvania Kumi. I am a senior researcher at the Zoological Station Anton Don at the Sicily Marine Center in, um, in Italy, in Palermo. And uh, I will present some work we did with Pristine Seas National Geographic, um, where we applied actually um, the MPA guides as part of a report to the Prime Minister of Greece, uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, to advise him on how to increase protection of uh, the Greek seas. Next slide, please. Uh, so, way to expand the protection in Greek waters. The Greek seas are a hotspot of marine biodiversity, hosting uh, threatened species such as the monk seal, the Mediterranean monk seal, or the marine mammals, sharks, and rays. Greece has uh, the right, but also the obligation, to conserve uh, its marine biodiversity based on numerous international and regional conventions that uh, it has signed, and as well as EU policies, and notably the EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, according to which uh, the member states of the European Union need uh, to protect 30% uh, of their land and uh, their sea, and uh, out of which 10% uh, has to be under strict protection, which would correspond to fully and highly protected areas. However, the Greek seas are uh, seriously depleted due to multiple human uses and mainly overfishing and global changes, uh, sea warming and invasive species. Uh, scientific data suggests that uh, the fishing catch in Greek uh, waters has decreased uh, significantly since the 1990s uh, because of overexploitation. Next slide, please. So what is the current protection status of the Greek waters? Well, it was uh, not uh, that straightforward to figure out, as I would have thought. So currently, there are more than 200 uh, marine protected areas uh, that have been designated in Greek seas, including Natura 2000 sites, which are uh, basically uh, areas of uh, conservation interest for the European Union. However, only up to September 2022, only 19 of uh, these MPAs had uh, legal acts that had actually regulations. So. Uh, communicating with the ministry, with uh, the agency for uh, protected uh, 
the management of protected areas, also management bodies of MPAs, uh, we were able to um, apply the MPA guide and to find out that only 13 MPAs are uh, implemented or actively managed in the Greek seas. Next slide. So with the Marine Conservation Institute, with Beth and her team, we assess the level of protection for each zone of each uh, protected area. So this is just an example based on the activities that uh, Jenna uh, showed earlier. So we could assess whether each uh, zone is uh, likely or highly or um, what was the level of protection. And through uh, the interview with the MPA managers, we could understand uh, the stage of establishment and also from uh, the legal documents. Next uh, slide, please. So we ended up with this. Uh, these were the results. Uh, so we found out that less than 0.8% of uh, the Greek uh, exclusive economic zone is under some form of protection. Uh, less than 0.1% is highly, fully or highly protected. Most of it uh, would be in the category of uh, lightly and minimally protected, and some of it was uh, incompatible with the conservation of nature. Next slide. And the percentage that is incompatible increases even more if we consider the Natura 2000 areas, which are uh, in purple stripes here. Uh, which uh, at the time, uh, and still today, I don't think they are effective, but they do not have uh, management uh, plans. Um, so, but while we were conducting this study, next uh, slide, please. Some uh, drafts of the management plans of the Natura 2000 uh, were publicly available for public debate. So this was because uh, the European uh, Union, the Court of Justice of the European Law, had condemned Greece for uh, not uh, applying effective uh, protection within its, uh, its uh, Natura 2000 sites. Uh, so there was some kind of a zoning plan for, uh, for this area, so I just show one indicative area, and uh, the results were quite disappointing because uh, like the um, absolute nature protection zones, with, which would correspond to the fully protected areas, uh, were very, very limited, so it would be the red areas in the map that is on the right. Uh, and in the case, for instance, of Yaros, uh, one of the full pro fully protected areas until recently, uh, the level of protection was actually like uh, being decreased. So that was quite uh, it's, uh, not very pleasant. So in uh, the end, uh, next um, next slide, please. Um, we, among our recommendation, was to implement the current uh, paper MPAs covering about 5% of the EZ as fully and highly protected areas to increase the 0.1% the that is right now highly protected and to contribute like this to the 10% um, to the 10% strict protection uh, target. Uh, if these were to be applied, their cost is estimated to be about 62 million euros in a single capital investment and the annual management cost about uh, 55 million uh, euros. This is assuming that uh, the management is doing, uh, we have separate management for each uh, protected area, which is not the case. And um, we also ran a bioeconomic model and we found that the economic benefits are expected to outweigh the costs within four years after implementation, mainly through uh, the development of the diving tourism and industry that right now it's um, underdeveloped in Greece. So the last uh, slide, please. So the latest news were, well, uh, the, let's say uh, what followed after is like a few months ago in April in our, co our ocean conference, uh, the Prime Minister uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, uh, during this uh, conference, uh, he announced the, the, 
designation of two new national parks, which on the map on the left are uh, like the striped white uh, areas, um, in which the measure that he basically uh, announced is that uh, trolling will be banned by 2026. And although this is generally, we could consider it as good news, uh, we can see with uh, com by comparing these areas by seeing the, the map on the right, uh, that uh, these areas are uh, avoiding totally the hotspots of uh, trolling and uh, that there was not much trolling anyway in these areas that uh, they, are, uh, they are proposing uh, as uh, the major, like, that would be the major uh, measure that would be taken within these areas. Uh, so this was uh, not even a low-hanging fruit. That was a, a fruit that was already on the ground, ready to be picked up. So we hope that in the next uh, few months, we will hear some more uh, meaningful measures for the protection of uh, the marine biodiversity uh, that, yes, there, there will be announced more meaningful measures uh, for uh, the real protection of the marine biodiversity in Greek waters. And I'm happy to answer later uh, more specific and detailed uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savan. Okay, I'll pass it over to Beth. Great. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, so I want to introduce myself. My name is Beth Pike. I'm the director of the Marine Protection Atlas, which is a project run by the Marine Conservation Institute. Uh, we run this program in parallel with our Blue Parks program, which serves as a way of celebrating uh, well-managed and well-protected areas. And uh, so I want to thank everybody, all the colleagues and co-authors here on this paper, but also on the paper we uh, managed to uh, published in the spring. It was the work of many people uh, to get this work done. And uh, so Jenna, are we just telling you when we want you to switch to the next slide? Okay, next slide. So for um, at least the last decade, the Marine Protection Atlas has been working to nuance the reporting of marine protected areas, uh, the World Database on Protected Areas, the official repository for all reported areas, both terrestrial and marine, uh, has a very large job to do. We focus only on the marine aspect of the reported areas. And what we've been doing for many years is trying to uh, kind of further nuance what's out there in regards to what's actually in place on the water and to some extent the level of protection and therefore likely benefits of these marine protected areas globally. Next slide. Uh, our work uh, over the past 10 years helped to uh, be serve as an impetus for the MPA guide work that followed. Uh, this was key to providing a common language around what marine protected areas are in regards to both stage of establishment and level of protection, which had been long understood to be a range, but had never been uh, fully defined. Next slide. Uh, with the recognition that the greatest conservation outcomes are linked to marine protected areas that are both fully and highly protected, as well as implemented on the water and better yet actively managed in regards to the fact that these plans that exist are, are periodically reviewed and updated and changed as, as needed. Next slide. So what we undertook was a review of the 100 largest marine protected areas that were reported to the World Database on Protected Areas in February of 2023. The largest 100 marine protected areas actually came out to be 203 different zones. The MPA guide is, a pro is applied on a zone, not MPA base. And of those, and those 203 zones of those 100 marine protected areas actually, actually contribute 90% roughly of everything that's reported as currently in the marine protected areas. So global marine protection is eight, currently around 8.3, I think actually now. Uh, I was 8.2 at the time. And what we reviewed 
uh, was actually about over 7% of that area. So what we did as a first step is to gather management plans, legal and regulatory documents, scientific literature, and then we followed up with firsthand communication with managers of these marine protected areas and other local experts uh, to have third party verification of what was reported to be happening and to actually implement what was happening. Uh, it's important to note that the MPA guide emphasizes the presence of activities that are happening, whether or not they are regulated uh, in, the, in the space. We also try to apply overlying regulations as, uh, as we're able. So for example, our marine protected area that sits within a mining uh, moratorium area wouldn't necessarily implement mining restrictions, uh, but would benefit from those. So we assessed for stage of establishment for all of the zones. We assessed the level of protection for all of the MPAs that were implemented or actively managed. And we were able to verify uh, through local experts and managers 81% of the assessments uh, that we did. Next. So this is what uh, was one of the graphics from the paper. So you can see of the global ocean area, that 30% target, you can see the 8% that is reported, the 7% we assessed, the amount of that that was actually implemented or actively managed, and within that, the amount that was fully or highly protected, which brings you to about 2.6% as of the paper. Our findings were that a quarter of what was being reported hadn't yet been implemented. So they were designated legally uh, or proposed, but they were not yet in place on the water. There was no change in behavior or regulations to be followed in these marine protected areas. One third of what was uh, assessed was actually allowing activities incompatible, things like industrial bottom trawling, uh, mining, oil and gas, things of that nature that are understood to be uh, at odds with the stated outcome of increasing biodiversity. And 36%, so about one third of everything was actually implemented and fully or highly protected. So uh, the good news is a third of that is actually there uh, and likely to be yielding biodiversity benefits. So what does this all mean? It just means Primarily that we're overestimating what we have on the water. Uh, this may be due to uh, lack of regulations or lack of implementation uh, or failure to account for these activities that are happening in some of these areas. Uh, we also noted that there was uh, an unequal distribution of these protections uh, the, with very few ecosystems being uh, evenly covered, most of it uh, was placed in remote in overseas territories. And this is, of course, a function of the fact that we looked at the 100 largest areas, and that's simply where these largest areas exist. So our, the recommendations from the paper were to ad adopt a quality indicator. So, you know, what we all recognize to be true is that uh, it's not just quantity, but quality that's going to matter. Uh, there needs to be investment for resources and capacity to the implementation of marine protected areas once they're legally designated. We should strive to uh, achieve full or high protection levels, uh, ones that give you the strongest return on your investment uh, when possible. Uh, at a kind of first cut level, we should probably uh, in, look at in prohibiting the industrial scale extraction from MPAs. These things just don't uh, contribute to the stated um, desired outcomes of marine protected areas. Uh, we need to be more fair, diverse, and equitable with marine conservation. Uh, we need to be conscious of the distribution of the responsibilities and burdens of these uh, strong protections and who's bearing that. Uh, we need to use the best available science and we need to be listening to all voices, uh, even those that traditionally haven't been heard in these spaces. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we do need to get MPAs on the high seas. So the ratification of the high seas treaty is going to be very important. 60% of the ocean is beyond any national jurisdiction. And without a high seas treaty, we have no way of ever really getting to 30% of the ocean or even close. So 
Thanks very much for including me in this panel. I look forward to answering questions afterwards. Thank you so much to all of these excellent speakers. I'm really excited we we did it. We have 20 minutes for discussion. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks again for being here. And um, yeah, so there are some resources on this slide of where you might find more information about the MK guide, including on the website and um, QR codes to some of the papers. I know that Katie in particular has been also posting the links in the chat to these papers, as well as the ones that different co-authors have mentioned. Um, and yeah, thanks again. I'll pass it over to Sarah to moderate the um, question and answer session. And again, if you have a question, please drop it into the Q&A box. Great. Yes, thank you. And I'm very uh, great uh, presentations and I'm very uh, impressed that everyone uh, finished in time. So uh, we'll start with the first question that came in during um, Stephen's presentation, uh, which was, was accessing data on conservation funding difficult? And in parentheses, public budget transparency. Um, it wasn't too difficult for the CNMI, I guess in, in full transparency, I worked um, for the CNMI government as a marine ecologist. So I was quite familiar with um, kind of the maze you might have to go to find where certain things are, you know, where the, where the budget memos go, um, but it it takes work, but it, at least in our case, was publicly available. I was not able to do that for WAM, um, which is why in our paper, you only see the, the figures coming out for the CNMI. Um, but I think what that in itself does highlight is the importance of having these local case studies, um, you know, initiated and conducted by people very familiar with the management landscape, right? Um, I think if perhaps someone not uh, that intimately knowledgeable about marine conservation on the ground in the Marianas tried to do this. Maybe um, it would have taken longer, or maybe um, you know, harder to open certain doors. Um, so I think that was kind of a leg up we had, but in our particular case, it wasn't that difficult to find the, the information. Right. Beth, did you wanna add anything about your experiences with this? Yeah, so that would fall under primarily enabling conditions, and it's one of many enabling conditions. And that was essentially the role of the third party verification was to ensure that uh, what was on paper was actually being enforced. And there's a number of ways that we looked at it. We weren't doing that MPA or zone by zone, but when it was uh, flagged as either a reason for a site not being effectively managed, or maybe because it was being effectively managed, we did note it. Yeah, I would say it's a really great question and thanks for asking. And I, I can't overstate the importance of understanding the context and what's happening in the area. Um, and, you know, on the ecological side too, um, you know, different types of activities are gonna have different impacts if they're at different scales and magnitudes over different types of habitats, like the anchoring example. It's different if you anchor directly on a coral reef or a seagrass bed than if you anchor somewhere less sensitive. So understanding Having the people that know those nuances and um, understand the context is particularly important to understand that expected benefits that you might get out of the areas. Thank you, everyone. Um, moving on to a different question uh, that came in. It is regarding communications. How can we define protected, in quotes, for the 30 by 30 goals in the general public's and government personnel's perceptions versus the MPA guide definitions? Yeah, I'd love, Sylvain, if you could talk a little bit more about strict protection in the EU, like in the targets and um, yeah, how the MPA guide might be useful or understanding quality might be useful in, in these conversations. But. Well, <laughs> uh, yes, according to the recommendations of uh, the European Union, the documents that have been released from the European Commission, uh, what we understand is that the strict protection should uh, correspond to fully protected areas, uh, or at least highly protected areas. But this is not how politicians and um, decision makers are uh, understanding it for some reason. 
So there is uh, a tendency to uh, this uh, strict protection not to really be strict. So um, I don't know, like my experience uh, from the different countries, I have seen that there is uh, unwillingness uh, to implement this uh, strict protection. But it is very important that um, like we can do this correspondence so to understand like in the what uh, this means. So we, then we can apply the MPA guide and to say, OK, we have this uh, progress, but then it will depend on how um, yes the politicians will um, yes will accept or not the definition of this uh, strict protection i don't know maybe it's not a very good example uh, the european union 10 per <laughs> 10 strict protection so i don't know if someone else wants to answer better this question i'd be happy to to chime in um from our experience we actually found that these distinctions um, of the different levels of protection were a useful communication tool that actually cleared things up and didn't add more confusion um, in the conversation. And so being able to kind of explicitly say like, well, is this a fully protected area, a full no take or a, a lightly protected and agreeing um, on those terms, those conditions, those expectations of social and ecological outcomes, I think was actually a very useful uh, thing that comes out of the language that the MPA guide provides that, you know, you're, you're both agreeing that this car you're looking at is a pickup truck and that a pickup truck can do certain things. And we're not expecting, right, a sedan to do the things that a pickup truck can do, but we want that sedan to be the best sedan possible if we're gonna use a little bit of an analogy. And I think that kind of brings the conversation more focused on kind of the goals and the outcomes is we're not disagreeing or misreading each other's expectations of the, of the outcome of this area so that we can then invest um, in realistic outcomes for uh, the ecosystems and for the communities. Okay. Wow. What a great analogy, Stephen. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. I love it. And I guess, yeah, you being able to, yeah, to, to call a spade a spade and, and for people to understand what can be expected out of their, you know, investments has been, I think, um, kind of a, a message that's come out in many of the assessments that have been done so far. Um, so people aren't expecting things that just aren't, it's not set up to be realized. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll move on to another question, uh, which starts, thanks for this useful webinar and interesting case studies. Question for Jen or Beth. Since most countries report levels of protection based on IUCN protection categories, have you developed a method for crosswalking those categories with the levels of protection in the MPA guide? Yeah, thanks so much. I can start with that one and then maybe pass to Beth um, to fill in more. But we, um, yeah, so as you saw in the slides, IUCN is a founding partner on this. We've been, you know, all working together to, to add value and not duplicate. So the management categories complement the level of protection and state of establishment in that um, they are based on the objectives of the area. What, what does management um, want to achieve? Whereas the level of protection is looking at the things that are actually happening in the water um, the the impacts of those activities and what um, the expected outcomes would be. So um, we've actually found through looking at, you know, the ICN management category and the level of protection of the same MPA um, that it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, that you wouldn't use the management categories to really be able to give you information about what the expected um, biodiversity conservation outcomes are, but you would use them to understand what you know? What do the what do the managers of this area want to happen? And then by using all the information, you can understand better: um, is the MPA actually set up to achieve those objectives? And I know that um, yeah, Beth, can I turn to you with um, anything else to add? Yeah, so I was trying to <clears throat> go back, but what we did find was you know the the IUCN category reporting is not required, and so actually a third of the MPAs didn't have it reported. So it's not always going to help you 
uh, determine that. And then we did at, um, at some point, and I don't have the numbers at the tip of my fingers, did try to look at IUCN categories versus um, protection levels. And other than things that were reported as 1A, which is a really a nobody goes there kind of space, uh, it, be, it from there it varied quite a bit, even in the national park or two, I used to say in category two, <clears throat> we had a broad variation in protection levels that fell under that uh, IUCN category. So as Jenna noted, it's an intent and objective type thing. Uh, it doesn't uh, line up perfectly with the protection level on the water and actually Katie has, and I was going to suggest we put that graphic up from the user manual. It kind of crosswalks IUCN category to MPA guide uh, to that, because I think that's super informative as well. Yeah, thanks. I can look for that and, and pass it along. And um, so it's sort of the logic being from, um, you know, management objectives from IUCN categories. Um, level of protection and expected outcomes from MPA guide, and then management effectiveness. Are we achieving the, whatever the management um, effect goals are? There's many tools for understanding that too, and those are also complementary and different from what the MPA guide does. Sorry, Katie. Um, if you wanted to jump in, Katie Nalvin is uh, based at Oregon State University too, and has been working on our team a lot. Thanks, Jenna. I was just pulling up that graphic. I can pop it in and screen share in just a moment. Okay. It's pretty complicated. Yeah, we let's see. I want to get to so many. There's so many. Yeah, go for it. Move, feel free to move along. Um. Okay. So as a next question, um, there was a question that came up the, during Sylvain's uh, talk. And one was asked, uh, Chris was asking about the resource and papers that described how you estimated the projected tourism benefits from the Greek protected areas. I don't that's something publicly available. There's interest in, in seeing that. Um, but also following up on that, asking if there would be a fee, if there's a feedback loop that would enable some of the tourism benefits to fund the ongoing management of the protected areas. So uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I so saw that there was a, a question whether the, this report is available. Uh, because this report was for the Prime Minister, uh, it is up to him whether he wants to make it uh, available uh, or not. So we have not published it from uh, our side, but I know that he has, uh, it has been distributed to some um, to the ministry and uh, to the organization uh, that uh, manages uh, protected areas. Um, on the other hand, uh, like about the tourist benefits. So this is like a global study that is led by uh, Enric Sala and uh, should be published uh, soon, I think. I was uh, checking now online to see if it was published or not. So I saw that there is a preprint. Pre uh, online and uh, they use uh, different case studies. So basically we followed uh, this methodology. And uh, so we found, for instance, like uh, because Greece has like a huge coastline, like uh, the biggest in the, the Mediterranean, but has uh, like proportionally very few diving centers. It, it could be much higher. The, um, the, the um, the number of uh, of the diving uh, centers or diving clubs there. Uh, the issue is that almost all of them are outside of protected areas and there is uh, no much uh, to see. Uh, so we believe that by uh, applying protection and uh, based on other numbers that we get from other areas in the Mediterranean, we could have a very important increase in uh, the diving tourism and uh, not only benefiting uh, diving clubs, but also like different uh, activities, restaurants and accommodation and all this that is related to this form of tourism. So there is a ve uh, very high capacity in increasing now uh, these uh, benefits. So we have included this analysis specifically for Greece and um, correcting the previous analysis that was made in a global level based on what we found uh, in the MPA guide. And uh, within our report, we, we do have uh, specific measures of how this could uh, get back 
to uh, the management. So very simple thing that's happening also in other protected areas uh, is like uh, each diver pays uh, a small contribution for actually diving within a protected area. And this comes back uh, to the management. Uh, I know that also last year in uh, Greek MPA, like in Alonisos, uh, there was a fee for uh, the ones that were coming also with uh, sailing boats uh, to and this is widely applied also in Croatia for instance so there are mechanisms um, I'm very sorry I cannot uh, share this uh, report uh, openly but this was made uh, for a specific purpose um, and uh, there was a direct communication of Enric Sala with uh, the Prime Minister. So it's uh, I'm just following Enric's orders on this uh, on this one. So yes, that's. Um, but I hope I answered some uh, of the question. Yes, thank you, Silva. Um, another question, based on your research. I think this. What are the lowest hanging fruit type activities that the government can do? to go from unimplemented to some protection, but may not be high full protection, and, and person fully appreciates this, this is key, but they do actually deliver positive benefits. What, what would some of those low hanging fruit activities be? Um, I think that that's a, a really great question and it, it speaks to kind of the utility um, of the MPA guide, as I mentioned earlier in kind of calling a spade a spade is, finding, you know, like, is that common knowledge in the community, right? Because sometimes uh, there can be a, a general understanding of um, a colloquial understanding of a marine protected area, meaning I can't do anything, right? But maybe that's not actually the case. And so some low hanging fruit is to identify those areas and figure out, well, are we clearly communicating this to our communities that this is what this space um, does allow and doesn't allow. I think that's a very easy thing to do, right? You can, typically it's not that expensive to make a sign uh, uh, at, at a point of entry towards that area. So I think that's a, a low hanging fruit um, opportunity. Um, and then kind of locking in commitments to the places that have already been identified as potentially being protected areas. Um, Cause one thing, I don't think we used any of the language, but um, we do want to be on the lookout for kind of downgrading and degazetting of some of these areas, right? And that type of backsliding is also um, uh, da dangerous, um, potentially. And so a low-hanging fruit is to not take our eye off of the things we already have while we're still trying to get towards these uh, larger goals, because, you know, we, we don't want to be so focused on the future that all the wins we've already uh, done, all the hard work and investment we've put in now are kind of being taken out, siphoned out the back, right? So I think those are some two low hanging fruit opportunities. It's kind of making sure we're locking in and securing um, the things we have done and making sure communicating kind of what those areas are meant to do. Okay. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everyone. Um, we'll do go to one last question. So we might run a couple minutes over, but um, we have a lot of great questions we weren't going to be able to get to, but they will be given to all the, the presenters and panelists um, so that they are able to see them. So the last question, um, thanks for all these great summaries. I know the big push is to get every MPA assessed in the first place, but do we yet have any sense of evolution or trajectory of performance of the global MPA network via the guide? As in, it, it, it's the global MPA network being assessed at the same place over different points in time or places being assessed over different points in time? I know this is probably wishful thinking, but just curious. Yeah, maybe Beth, do you wanna, do you wanna work on that one? Yeah, I took a, I took a stab at uh, answering this in the, Q and A as well, and I, you know, I think what we do know as best we're able is kind of globally what the picture looks like. Where we don't know as much is in lower level, subnational, regional areas because you'd have to 
perform the assessment specifically on those areas. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, the Greece is a good example, uh, the regional uh, analysis done by Stephen and Angelo. Uh, these types of studies will bring to light what these regional and subnational targets look like. Uh, but there's over 18,000 marine protected areas currently uh, reported. And so, in, you know, unless you're doing a specific review in a certain area, uh, to take uh, that expertise in the area and apply what's actually happening on the water. These take a really long time to do these MPA guide assessments. It's not as straightforward as a regulatory review because you have to go there and talk to people who know what's really happening on the water. And so they do take a bit longer to do. So yeah, please jump in and help. And if you have an area you wanna do, uh, all of us would love to help you with that. The MP Atlas uh, project has an online portal that you can use that steps you through the MPA guide and you can try to apply it to places you're familiar with. Uh, we're always happy to work with groups that are interested in applying this to their studies and their uh, analysis. So thanks. Thank you so much. I know we're just over time. It's been really wonderful to have all these questions. I know there are many great ones we didn't get to. Please get in touch um, in the last few seconds before everyone goes on with their days and nights. Um, Beth is leading a workshop at the International Marine Conservation Congress, um, and many of us will be there in South Africa in October. If anyone will be there in person, please come find us. Um, and then lots in the chat on how to get in touch with these different co-authors, um, many of us here, like the speakers here, all of us, and then uh, additional people who have worked with the MPA guide, very happy to be a resource. And Katie's put a ton of great info in the chat. So please um, get in touch if you if you want to talk more. And I'm sorry to those who haven't, who've been raising their hands and writing questions that we didn't get to, but please, um, please do reach out to us. And thanks again so much. And thank you everyone. Thank you for attending and thank you to our wonderful presenters. Have a great rest thank of your you. day. Thank you.